Welcome. Jeff Johnston here with the Living Undeterred podcast. Uh, super, super beyond excited for today's show. Um, all because of a chance encounter at a John Varvada store in Las Vegas, Nevada last year. Um, today we have our guest, Randy Spencer. Uh, and I had a tremendous opportunity this summer. Our tour did to stop and talk to Randy and do some uh, advocating and some collaboration. Mental health's a big issue today. And um, the Alice Cooper Solid Teen Rock Center in Phoenix and Mesa have been so pivotal in talking to kids, to adolescents about the issues of mental health and substance use and, uh, and addiction. So Randy, welcome to the show. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, again, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me, Jeff. It's great to see you again. And it's always nice to hang out with a fellow hard rock fan and fellow Judas Priest fan. Yeah. And I uh, saw Judas last year. I saw Maiden and I saw this, this uh, good looking guy over my shoulder here, uh, Alice Cooper as well. Um, what a show he puts on Randy for his age. Um, he must be in a lot of shape. <laughs> he must take care of himself pretty good. I know we're going to talk a little bit about Alice, about his sobriety and some of the stuff he does, but man, just as a musician, you know, who better out there than Alice Cooper? Yeah, he's out there working hard. He's beyond healthy. And, you know, I've seen a few shows this year and it's great to see people out and about with their friends and they're having a great time. And there's a community, of course, to going to concerts. And it's just great to see people enjoying themselves and being able to live life and be able to get out there. And people are just really having a great time attending live music again. And that's great, I think, not only for the performers, but the crew people and the promoters and the audience. And it's just refreshing. And people need that shot in the arm, I think, to go see live music. So we just happened to stumble upon the uh, Teen Rock Center, uh, again, like I said earlier, on a chance meeting uh, in Las Vegas. Um, I was telling the owner of the store, Joy, at John Varvados there at Caesars Palace about our story, about our tour and all that. And she immediately wanted me to meet Alice and Cheryl. And they just happened to be in the back of the store. You know how fate kind of works out, Randy. Um, yeah. And I knew it was Alice. Even without his makeup on, I could tell it was him. Um, he's got some pretty defined features, as we know. And um, boy, I tell you, the minute, the minute I talked to him and Cheryl, we didn't talk about music at all. We talked about uh, alcohol. We talked about sobriety. We talked about recovery. And we just hit it off really well. And then Cheryl said, hey, you know, do you guys have a stop in Arizona? And I said, well, we don't. And she said, you do now. And man, I tell you, my eyes welled up with tears. Um, I gave them a hug. And I'm so grateful that they invited us to stop. And then we reached out to you and Jeff. And I kind of thought maybe you would think I was just some stalking fan or something. And man, you and Jeff were so, you guys were so great to welcome our family into your family. And I am forever indebted for giving this guy from Iowa a shot. You know, we didn't really have a story. I didn't have a tour before you guys trusted us. Um, hopefully we came out there and did a good job for you guys uh, on, on what we tried to do that day. But I just want to thank you personally from, from my heart and from my family for allowing us to come out to collaborate that day, that wonderful day this last summer, um, all because of a chance meeting with Alice and Cheryl. It's our pleasure. <clears throat> We've had great feedback, even as recent as a week or two ago from people talking to us about the event, and it's definitely made a lot of ripples in the community. So we appreciate you being there. How long have you known Alice and Cheryl yourself? I think I've known Alice now for about maybe about 10 years since I've been at this organization. And how long has the teen center been up and running? Um, our 501c3 has been open for almost 27 years. Wow. And we started our teen center 10 and a half years ago. So next year will be the 11th year of our teen center. It'll be the third year for our our second teen center in Mesa, Arizona. Hmm. What has Alice and Cheryl meant to the community? I mean, I, I just can't put into words when I was walking through that place, just how freaking awesome it is, Randy. You guys are just pinching yourself every day, I bet, how special it is to be in the midst of something so wonderful, especially especially opening the doors for the troubled youth of the community and giving them giving them another chance, you know? We talked about that yesterday at our staff meeting, that our staff is so blessed and so fortunate to get to do what we do. But 
you know, for us to have a 28,000 square foot center, which mm -hmm. is what we sort of call as a rock and roll theme boys and girls club. It's not only rock and roll kids that come out to our center, it's all youth, but for kids to be able to have access to a free dance studio and a free art studio and a rock and roll stage they can jam on that has had famous musicians like John Five and Sister Sledge perform on and Glenn Sobel, Alice Cooper's band. And it's just a breath of fresh air for people to be able to spend their time and, and come out and come together and for kids to have a safe space. And it means a lot to the community. And we're really fortunate that a lot of people in the community where we live and beyond around the world that people want to support us. It's just, it's an honor. So when I had the pleasure of meeting them, I, I was stunned to know Alice had been sober uh, or in recovery, I guess, for 43 years, I think, or 44 years. Um, and as I started learning more about musicians out there, there's a lot of musicians out there that have been sober a long time um, that, that talk about it. Um, how important is it to you that, especially in the music scene with young kids that are getting into drugs and alcohol so quickly, it seems like, um, having icons like Alice and, uh, even Rob Halford, I think a Judas priest has been sober now for a very long time. How important is it that these guys, um, let people know that, that, that is a alternative way to be a rock star to, to do it sober. Well, I think it is important. I mean, our health is everything. And if you're healthy, you have a clearer mind to focus, to do your song lyrics, to do your performance, you know, to do recordings, you know, you have to have great you know, strength to be able to tour 100 and 150 days a year. And you're all that alcohol and all those negative things eventually catches up to your body. And I've been around, you know, for 35 years around a lot of rock and roll musicians, a lot of musicians of all styles of that matter. And when you're healthier, whether you're in or in you're an athlete or you're in construction or you're in banking or you're in rock and roll, you're going to be able to perform a lot better in life. And you're going to be able to interact a lot better and your personal relationships, your most intimate relationships, mm -hmm. your friendship, your spouse, your family members, you're going to have a much more positive uh, atmosphere in those relationships. And that helps you and them to make a better community, helps you to make a better neighborhood. And we've all seen, sadly, when people get in a, you know, they get a little rowdy after they have five or six beers and, mm -hmm. you know, the guy down the street does this or does that or does this in this bar or or we just saw it recently that a bunch of people were fighting at sports events. And, mm -hmm. you know, that that's not a healthy thing for anyone individually or within our communities. It doesn't do anything positive. So it's important to stay healthy overall if we can. And I got the feel when I, we were there for the tour this summer that it's more of a of an arts type uh, um, program you guys have. You have the, the art, the, the drawing. Um, is it uh, Leroy Neiman? Is that who? We have a Leroy Neiman art studio. We're one of only 13 in the U.S. And that's, and, and again, you just, you think that this is just, you know, a rock and roll place where kids can come in and jam, but it's a lot more than that. You have your break room, pool table room. There's, you know, there are some sets set up where people can play. And Roman, he got to go and listen to, um, I think there was a songwriting uh, clinic or a class that one of the actual adolescents was running. So you're, philosophy there randy if correct me if i'm wrong is a lot of it's peer-to-peer -peer, right we've given seven teens i'd say ages 16 to 22 uh jobs part-time or full-time jobs at our teen center as those teens have grown into our program and they've really heightened their skills and it's really amazing to see that and we see that all the time if an 18 year old kid is embracing a, a guitar student who's 14 They'll listen to that 14, that 18 year old a lot more than maybe a 50 year old guitar student. And we oh, have yeah. great 50 year old, 50 year old teachers, you know, the phenomenal. But yeah. when it's 18 years old or 16 years old and you have a 16 year old art kid teaching a 14 year old art kid for the first time, they listen a lot more. And if you have an 18 year old kid that also says, Hey, I was not doing anything three years ago. And now I've recently played guitar in front of the national anthem before ZZ Top, mm. before 50,000 people, or I got to open for Social Distortion with my band, or I got to get a college scholarship because I went to the teen center. That 14-year-old kid says, you're 19 and I can do what you can do. Right. And you just have that immediate inspiration and that immediate hope. They can relate 
to that closer age so much better than they can from say someone like you and me. Um, that just seems further, but I think social proofing is a, a big, um, advantage or a big, um, benefit to what you guys do. Cause that's the feeling I got walking around. There was just kids, kids leading kids. You know, you're, you're kind of getting the next generation of young leaders prepared for the real world through the rock center there. And it's an uplifting, positive atmosphere. For example, we have an open mic once a month. And if the kids make a mistake, the other kids, they clap, they move, they, they encourage the student to be better. They don't just like, you know, laugh and, and everything like that. We have an uplifting atmosphere where we want to see more kids support each other. And we ask people, Hey, write songs together, mm. you know, create gigs together. You know, this isn't just a, about one person succeeding. This is about a whole village succeeding of kids. So if somebody comes in um, and you guys literally allow kids to come in from, you know, off the streets, technically. Um, and, but they have even a, people, what's Minnesota, that? Minnesota, eh? Pardon? Even people from Minnesota, eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, if someone came into your facility, but they had a very serious substance abuse problem, or you could tell they had a mental health issue, do you guys then refer them out to, because you guys really don't have the capabilities or the desire to get into that part uh, too deep, but do you guys then refer out to facilities where they can get treatment? We welcome everybody ages 12 to 20. There's no restrictions. We're not licensed therapists. We're right. not licensed counselors, but we do have outsourced partners that often come on site or we can connect them with. And if they have, if you would say deeper issues, whether they need psychological counseling or they need to go into recovery, we have those options. In fact, we've had several teens that are now in their early 20s that have gone um, then when they were 14, 15, 16, they went through recovery. They went through certain places where they overcame suicidal attempts. And now a couple of those teens are becoming doctors. Mm -hmm. One is now on her way to become a full-time psychologist. So she wants to do children's psychology, all based on her own story and based on the fact that she went to the Rock Teen Center. And then that change of life really accelerated her pathway to thinking about becoming a psychologist. And she's literally graduating right now, about to start her career. Uh, six years later, she's thriving and doing great. So there, we have several examples of that. That's got to make everybody there feel so good to see stories So beautiful, like that. so amazing. And I can't wait to hear that young lady's story of how many other teens she's going to help in her vocation. It's so amazing. Yeah, because teens are just so lost today that they can see someone that has been in their shoes do well, uh, or improve their life. I think that gives them a lot of, um, a lot of motivation. Let me segue to something. Now, when this posts, this podcast will post next year. This, this currently is right before Christmas of 2022. Um, but you guys have wrapped up your 20th annual Alice Cooper's Christmas pudding. Um, talk a little bit about that. Uh, that's an awesome idea. And I, I watch it online when you guys posted your videos and tell us a bit about the idea behind that and kind of how it's grown to be as, you know, kind of like the, the backbone of what you guys do now is this Christmas pudding every year. Well, as a 501c3, uh, we're a small nonprofit with a big name. So we have to do fundraising like any other nonprofit. Yep. And one of our main fundraisers is an event called Christmas Pudding. Uh, we've had that now for 20 years. And we've had Kiss at that event, and Larry the Cable Guy, Johnny Depp, uh, Joan Jett, Glenn Campbell. Mm. Um, over the years, it's just been a variety show. And this year was our biggest fundraiser. We raised over a million dollars net at that event. Wow. Uh, we had people like the band Six Wire uh, from Nashville, who was on the show Nashville on ABC. Uh, we had Jim Brewer, the comedian from Saturday Night Live, yep. Wally Palmer for the Romantics. Uh, we've had just oh, so many performers at that event. Alice Cooper, of course, and we've had the Hollywood Vampires. And we literally had people fly in from all over the world and they purchase a regular ticket. But then we might have like a really large, you know, painting that maybe Rob Halford or Rob Zombie mm -hmm will sign on stage and that might sell for 30 or $60,000. And we've had people, you know, buy an auction items for an example that you can get first row tickets to see kiss 
You can go backstage and meet the band for a private meet and greet mm. and fly in the jumbo jet with the KISS members oh to the concert. Oh and my. something like that might sell for fifty or sixty thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars. And then there's usually a second person in the audience that wants that more than have a match. So we have a really great base of donors wow. that really want to support kids. And then the other aspect is we have about 60 teens perform at that event, whether that's dancers or we do a thing called the Bucket Brigade, which is like stomp. And we have eight kids playing on buckets. And we might have a local band that wins our music competition and a local solo artist. And to have those kids interact with the Jim Blossoms backstage or Gretchen Wilson wow. or Sister Sledge and be able to get encouragement from those famous artists and just to be able to have that opportunity to perform at those events is life changing for those teens. Yeah, I can't even imagine what it's like for those kids. Um, you know, like I said, walking through the hallways there, seeing all the memorabilia, you know, and I think for Alice, there's kind of a resurgence in his music today. Um, I think there's a lot of kids that are, I'd say Gen Z that, that 12 to 25 that maybe hadn't heard of Alice a few years ago. Now they are being taken to concerts by their dads and their moms. You know, um, my youngest son, Roman, who you met, um, he wasn't overly familiar with Alice prior to coming out there. He's 19. Well, now he knows all of Alice's songs and his friends do as well. But I think it's kind of cool that you see some of these older rock guys, uh, even Iron Maiden, Judas Priest seem to have a little bit of a resurgence as well. But that's got to be kind of cool to sit there in, from your lens and kind of see all this going on. It's great for discovery, isn't it? When we all discover mm -hmm. something and Alice's team has been very smart of getting him on the road with Motley Crue, yeah. getting him on tour with Marilyn Manson. You know, a few weeks ago, Alice Cooper's team announced that they're on the Def Leppard, saw that. Uh, I'm gonna get Molly tickets. True Poison tour, yeah. about eight dates next year, and that opens up a whole new floodgate of people. And isn't it really cool when we go to a Kiss concert and we can maybe see a 60 year old grandfather yep. with his 40 year old son and his 12 year old yep. kid <laughs> all go to the concert together? It's beautiful. You know, and I have a buddy in, in Colorado that's a big rock fan, and they're big fans of Jeff Tate of Queens Rock. Oh yeah. Heard. Yep. His uh, daughter, Chloe, goes to our center once in a while, although they live in Colorado. But we just gave them free tickets to see Jeff Tate. Um, and a lot of our kids just recently saw Jeff of Queensryche. And they got to sit at Soundcheck, have a private meet and greet, do a Q&A uh, when a musician like that. But to see parents and teens enjoy something like that is just really, it's triple amazing. And for Alice to be able to do things like that and a lot of other musicians, it's really smart branding. It is. And I, I, um, I didn't know that his wife was actually uh, on the stage with him uh, for the performance in, until I actually saw, well, I guess I knew, but I forgot that when I saw Alice live um, last year, uh, Cheryl's up there uh, helping out, which I think, I think it's really cool. Cause then they meet basically that way. Yeah. Alice and Cheryl uh, met because years ago, Alice's wife, Cheryl Cooper was uh, studying to be a ballet dancer in right. college and she auditioned to do an Alice Cooper uh, video, but she didn't know who Alice Cooper was and <laughs> oh, who's she? So they actually met that way. And then a few months later, she got invited to audition to sing a, to be a backing singer on the tour. And she went and attempted that. And she's been together with Alice for 50 plus years now at this point. And she sings on stage. She's one of the evil nurses. Yeah, She's one of the I remember. pivotal people on stage. She stabs him with the yep. <laughs> with the needle. She puts his head in the guillotine. She sings backing vocals. We're running the teleprompters. And she's beyond a rock star in her own right. I mean, they're just the most, the two of them are a really powerful force, but gracious people. They love, love, love people. And that's what keeps them, you know, where they're at in their life because they embrace life. They're, they're not sitting on their couch watching football games on a Sunday. They're out rehearsing and getting ready to go on tour and staying in shape. And um, I, I just have so much uh, respect for, you know, the Bruce Dickinson's of the world, the Rob Halford's of the world, you know, this, these people I grew up with, I even saw scorpions are touring now or are wrapping up their tour out in Las Vegas and stuff. It's like these old school bands that I grew up with. Uh, it's just refreshing to see them out, you know, getting new fans playing, 
you know, playing their old music, but also, also taking a chance with new music, you know? Um, so does Alice have uh, a set of new, new, I know he did an album recently, right? That was new. 2023 looks to be pretty busy. I believe that they're going to put out a new Alice Cooper record. I saw that. And they have Hollywood Vampires Dates, which is Alice's side band with Joe Perry of Aerosmith and Johnny Depp on guitar. And they'll do a lot of Alice Cooper touring dates. They have a 75th uh, birthday book coming out for Alice Cooper in February. Alice's birthday will be, he'll be 75 this Hmm. February. So they have a big documentary book documenting his whole life. He's always doing something. He's always in a TV show or a, or a commercial, but when he's on the road, he's always thinking about the teen center and calling in and meeting with people and telling people about the importance of helping teens. And he's involved in philanthropy around the world, helping a lot of people. How often does he pop into the center unannounced or is most of his stops pre-planned? When he's in town, he comes here quite a bit. So he's at the center quite a bit throughout the year. They're on the road about 160 days a year, if not more. Mm, wow. So they're always at a comic con or a recording session or a tour date or doing a movie or, or something, but he's here working with the kids quite a bit. You know, he's got a passion that I know he likes when he gets away from music and we all have to have something to go to and it's golf, which, you know, golf is a big part of our story in my book. I think I, I think I attribute like six chapters to how golf saved our life. And then, our son Ian used golf after Seth died, raising money for mental health. Um, and so Alice likes to golf. Uh, how often does he play a week? And I know he runs his tournament every year, and that's still that's still a big deal, right? Yeah, Alice golfs probably six to seven days a week. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> Whenever he's on tour, he's sponsored by Callaway, so he gets you know play at some of the best golf courses around the world and. It's a really great relaxing thing for him. He, he loves doing that. And that's become a second big fundraiser for our teen centers where we have a big rock and roll golf tournament where we have a lot of various celebrities and athletic world and sports and entertainment actors and musicians. And we do a rock and roll concert with people like Robbie Krieger, the doors and Alex Lifeson of rush or Danny Serafin of Chicago, Tommy Thayer kiss. And they all come out and do a free a, a concert as a fundraiser. Then the next morning they all golf together with Alice and a bunch of our donors. Um, when's the date for this one in 2023? It's going to be April, 2023. We'll have a date really soon. And if anybody wants to find out about it, they can go to our website or they can even call our office and ask for me. Uh, but the date's, the date's not set yet. Right. Randy, not set. We're going to change the. We have to change the date, but it's not set yet. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm really interested in coming out at some capacity. Um, love to have you. Yeah. I mean, it'd be, it'd be awesome. Even just if we could just drive the RV out for that, for that event. Um, it's about when I'll be getting it out of storage. <laughs> um, you'll have a great, you'll have a great time. We're always honored to do it. We have about 2,600 people that attend the concert and dinner the night before hmm. and about 170 golfers, uh, from around the U S the next morning. Well, certainly, certainly when that date gets finalized, uh, let's make sure that we have a chance to talk about it. Cause I think living undeterred would be that'd be perfect for us, uh, for what we're trying to do as well. Right. We'd love to have you all. All right. So I want to talk about something that you wanted, uh, to talk about as well, that, uh, I followed a little bit online and that was scream for me. Um, scream for me is an initiative you guys have taken and, um, tell the followers and listeners a little bit more what scream for me is and uh, how important it is for you and for the teen center there. Although where we live in Phoenix, where our second teen center is a suburb called Mesa. It's one of the largest cities in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And the New York times actually recently wrote and called the city of Mesa and said, why is teen suicide so high in Mesa? It's one of the highest for teens in the state of Arizona. So we met with a lot of city leaders um, earlier this year and they went to our teen center and said, how do we find a way to reduce teen suicides? I mean, there's been like once a, one a month mm-hmm. or something the last 24 months. So we just kind of brainstormed. And, and one thing that I suggested is we have a good relationship with Brian Head Welch, the guitar player of the renowned band Corn, mm-hmm. And Brian's got a great story of overcoming substance abuse and being out of Corn and coming back into the band as he's gotten clean and sober and talking about overcoming depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts and mm-hmm. 
-hmm. He goes around the world and speaks a lot about those topics specifically for youth. So I suggested that we have Brian Head Welch come out. We reached out to Brian and he was fortunate enough to say yes. And we did an event called Scream For Me. We actually have a shirt right here about it. Mm. Yeah, And the whole concept, if you see on the very bottom, the whole concept of that is some teens might not feel comfortable to say, I'm thinking about ending my life. And if they're struggling with that, they can say scream or scream for me to a parent, a teacher, a friend, a counselor, or they can say scream. And that's a code word of sorts for them to be able to get help. But what mm. we decided to do is we printed thousands of T-shirts gave them out for free to students in the Mesa School District, uh, gave out free wristbands, and they had a 24-7 counseling line on there that if they wanted to chat on the internet or text or do a phone call, if they needed counseling or they needed to discuss um, possible suicidal mm -hmm. uh, thoughts, they can go to that uh, counseling service 24-7. And we did the event Scream for Me where we had death to life, a gentleman named Mario who runs yep, that. I met him out there. He was out there at our stop. Yep. He talked about his organization and what they do to help reduce suicide for teens specifically. He interviewed Brian Head Welch of Corn, and we had about 1,200 kids show up at a high school. Wow. And then we had a performance where Brian Head Welch not only performed, but we had about six teens back him up and we did about four songs set. And what we found was really amazing. Kids were listening. Uh, it wasn't like they just kind of like saw the music, then went out to the lobby and came back and saw the music. They were sitting with full attention mm -hmm. and they were craving to get information. They were craving, you know, to get information about how to overcome their anxiety and their depression. And if they're thinking about potential suicide or they had a friend and we saw some great significant impact. We even had Instagram come on board as a sponsor and Meta who owns Instagram gave us a bunch of free ads and gave us a personal donation and knock on wood, we had 1200 kids show up. The after part of that was we were able to take all of those videos and school districts around the whole state of Arizona have been playing them in classrooms that if the kids could not go to the event, they've been able to get information on, on suicide prevention mm -hmm. or be able to go to the counseling hotline and see the performances and see the conversation with Brian Head Welch. And it's just, I don't know the numbers yet because we don't have the exact data. The event happened in September of 2022, but we've just seen so many kids embrace that and want to get knowledge and resources. Isn't it amazing where, you know, how these things just kind of take a life of their own. You know, you, you start a project, you right. do something, and then you meet somebody, you put your heads together, come up with an idea. And all with the same purpose, and that's to save lives. And when I met you uh, on the tour, I met you actually twice last year, but when we came out for an actual tour stop, I was quoting a number that was 800 a day. If you remember from my presentation, Randy, yes. and that's 800 a day, that's Americans that die from overdose, alcohol, and suicide. Okay. And I just been informed by a friend of mine that I need to change that number. And unfortunately, it didn't go down. It's now 822 right. a day. So just Terrible since I staff. just since I've been out there, Randy, 22 more Americans a day die from overdose, suicide, and alcohol. So let me ask your opinion, since you've been on watching this happen and you're in the trenches every day, more, more than I am. Why do you think kids today are so lost with the fact that they have so much in the in the palm of their hands in regards to technology and abundance and and um why why are kids so unhappy today this generation has high anxiety high anxiety um they're highly introverted as well so they're not really instantly gonna come out and say i need help and they're also very guarded and many teens today suffer a lot of disappointment mm -hmm. and they have a lot of um, trust issues with adults, for example, they may have a family member or a foster leader or whoever's in their life say, I'm going to go out and do something with you this weekend. Then that family member doesn't show up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That happens over and over. Yeah. So they come to our teen center and they think that our adults and our volunteers and our staff are similar. 
and it takes about four or five times for them to come to our center and really build a trust. Not every team, but the majority of teams, we, we've seen with that. And it just seems like, I don't know, we can always say we can blame it on the internet, we can blame it on video games, we mm-hmm. can blame it on this, but there's a, there's a lot of isolation today, mm-hmm. and there's not as much socialization as you and I had mm-hmm. when we were growing up. And I don't know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think that's a, a, a very large aspect that the kids are just really highly anxious. We have a lot of kids that come to our center and they just tell us right off the bat, they said, well, I might not be talking to anybody when I come to your center. And some of them just want to listen to music in the quarter, but mm-hmm. we we're grateful for that because they're in a safe space. They're doing something in a safe space versus out in the streets or, or, or something else. And we see a lot of high homelessness a lot of high depression in kids as well. A lot of kids are couch surfing and they just don't want to be around their family. Mm. Everything. It's just really, really a hard time. It's a hard time to be a teen. COVID, of course, has yeah. extremely increased that. The school district recently told us they're seeing kids in fourth and fifth grade recently tell them at schools that they're thinking about committing suicide as, as early as fourth yeah. and fifth grade. And yeah, that's a that's a heavy responsibility for a lot of kids to have that much stress and pressure at, at an age of six or seven or eight. It's really, really difficult right now to be a teen, but that's why we wanted to create our teen centers so there could be a refuge and a hope and a, and a place that kids can spend their time and have positive leadership and have something to express themselves that if they're coming in and they're doing an art piece, even if it's an aggressive art piece, they're doing something positive with their time if they're screaming in a microphone that's therapy if they're Mm -hmm. doing a really heavy heavy guitar riff that's therapy if they're throwing a basketball against the wall and they're frustrated that's therapy for them in some ways or therapy is just for them to sit in a bench and have a safe space to spend their time that that's a that's a great answer to to the question about why are kids so lost today because I think Randy, you're so spot on. I think it's so easy for us to just start pointing fingers. Oh, it's the internet. It's social media. It's cell phones. It's like, you know, that, that could certainly contribute, but I think you hit the nail on the head with isolation. I just think kids today have kind of painted themselves into a corner in the quest to have all this stuff at the palm of their hand, you know, TikTok and Instagram and eight second videos all day long. Most are just right. meaningless wastes of time is that they've, they've basically allowed these vehicles to do their thinking for them. So kids today can't close their eyes at one o'clock in the afternoon and just sit still for 10 minutes, i.e. meditation. They can't do that. It's it's hard for them to stop their brain. So what they do, since they don't want to think all day because that's too much effort, they look at their phone and the phone does the thinking for them. Right. And that just creates this isolation. It makes it worse exponentially don't you think you know i agree and another thing i just want to add please is acknowledgement is really important because a lot of teens they're not acknowledged they're not acknowledged that they're home they're not acknowledged at dinner sometimes they're not acknowledged by they don't have any friends in school sometimes their teachers don't acknowledge them so if they come to our teen center like ours every time our staff we pass a teen in the hallway we always just say hi or we give them a high five that might be the only interaction that they get all day. Hmm. And for teens to be acknowledged, I think that really elevates them a lot and it gains their their confidence. We had one parent come to our teen center last year and he said, hey, my son doesn't have any friends at school. And this parent was almost, ex- he was just so exhausted and desperate to find a sense of community for his son. And he said, my son gets made fun of because he likes music like Rush and Hmm. he likes music like Yes and Deep Purple and Pink Floyd and none of the the kids laugh at him at school. And he just wants to find a space. And we heard about your center. Like, do you guys have anything, any kids here that like that music? And I said, I think about 27 of them. He said, 27? Are you kidding? Yeah. It was a Thursday. And I said, what are you guys doing tomorrow? He said, we have no plans. I said, Come over tomorrow about four o'clock and I'll bring over some kids and you guys can jam with some kids. So a few months later, I called about eight kids and said, who I knew liked that kind of music. I said, I have this new student at our center. Would you be willing to come and meet him? 
And that's what our center is about. It's like we have a lot of kids and they just want to hang out and just kind of, you know, be a positive force for other people. And we had six kids show up the next day. Hmm. And that encouraged that teen and that dad so much. And now two years later, that young man is doing better in school. He's got a better uh, relationship with his father. He's in a couple of bands. Hmm. Great. He's thrived as, not only as a person, but he's thrived more as a musician and he's happier and he's also alive. So we don't know the full dynamics of what these kids are dealing with, but we hear a lot of challenging stories out there like that. But our center is able to be, again, a refuge for a lot of those type of kids. Yeah, the suicide thing's a really big issue. Um, you know, you, you can help anybody that's alive. You can't help them when they're not here. And right. I think that goes kind of in hand with harm reduction, which we talk a lot about on, on our side of the fence with drug addiction and abuse, is, you know, these chances that we have to give these kids one more day. You know, we, we need to get, we're responsible for them, obviously as parents, but as a society, to not give up on them and to be less judgmental, um, less critical of the challenges that they're having. Just because maybe I didn't go down those roads um, doesn't mean I can't respect and understand what they're going through. And a lot of times they just need to be heard. They just need someone to talk to, you know? They need to be heard and they need a shot of hope because a lot of kids, they don't have a goal. Right. They don't have dreams. So we need to give them an opportunity to have a dream. So we need to like introduce them to, hey, here's a volunteer and she'll give you a free camera class or mm -hmm. she'll give you a free art class. And it's an opportunity for someone to say, well, I could dance for the first time. I can take art for the first time. They can discover what they're great at. And then they can start excelling at that. And they can start finding their own community of eight other kids that like to play drums or like to play guitar or like to do art. And they can start thriving in those areas. And that's life-changing for a lot of kids that don't know how to dream, mm. that don't have a dream, but they don't even know how to dream. They're just thinking that everything is just hopeless for them. But we can give them an opportunity to go to college and get jobs and be able to thrive in life and succeed. What other projects do you have in mind? I mean, uh, you know, you've, you've got this big facility there. It looks like it's fairly, you know, it's full. You guys, you know, are, are, I don't know if you're at full capacity. I think you guys can still take, you know, kids coming in, but what other areas of say, you know, this, you got music, you got art, you got things like that. What other areas do you think you guys could get into to help kids? Well, I think that we'll definitely want to grow in theater. There's a lot okay. of drama and theater opportunities right. that takes us a, a rehearsal space of the right staff to be able to do that. There's interest in that. We've done a little bit of that, you know, but I think that we have our eye on a third teen center. We want to be able to grow. I was going to ask you that question. It seems logical. Two to three years. Yeah. And just continue the model that we have. You know, right. we have a great recording studio, just like you'd see in LA or Nashville. We have a great stage that teens could perform at open mic. And we have a lot of high level musicians that come out and work with the kids. And we have mm -hmm. a phenomenal art studio. And we're really blessed to be able to have some really good programs. So I think we'll continue to have guest workshops. We have guest workshops all the time of various topics. But I think we'll just continue those. And then hopefully over time, and as funding allows, we'll just open a third and a 14 center and just reach other geographical areas that are a little, um, not as close to our teen center so we can reach other areas that other teens don't have options. Yeah. I think I told you guys the first time we met you guys, I said, man, this model could be replicated. And I think one of your concerns were, you know, trying to do things too fast, you know, it's like, well, let's get really good at what we do here first. And then we can take that model and plant it in other places because, you know, Alice Cooper doesn't have any boundaries. I mean, his name is <laughs> it's known everywhere in the world. So why limit the teen center to have boundaries, right? You know? Yeah. We'd have 70 or 700 centers around the world. If it was a quality experience, right. if we had the right staff running it, if people understood the culture, but then that would take a lot of manpower and a yeah. lot of dollars to be able to do that. And we want to make sure that we really have the capacity to be able to implement everything we want to do. And it's a quality experience when kids walk in the door that they can feel really loved and really served well. Do you have like an alumni um, area where kids can come back and maybe um, 
And I know in recovery centers, they have alumni come back and actually talk to the current people there. But do you guys have something like that where you can start building like an alumni wall? Or do you have any really somebody famous that's come through the center that that uh, made it really big in, in Hollywood or in, in, in on stage or in music? We see teens all the time, three, four or five years later, they grow their talents and they say, I want to start volunteering here. Awesome. And they start giving art and music and dance lessons to other teens and they mentor kids. And then we do a music competition every year. It's sort of like Alice Cooper's version of American Idol. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, 18 years ago. Our first winner was Jordan Sparks. Yes, man. And she won American Idol uh, two years later. So that's the biggest um, success story that we have. She actually wore an Alice Cooper Solid Rock Teen Center wristband on the show a few times. But we've had other teens go on to be on American Idol, to be on The Voice, to record in Los Angeles and Austin with people who work with the like bands like Jet and The Darkness right. and Jack Johnson. And, you know, they're really pursuing their career in a very serious way. And we provide a lot of opportunities for kids to open for people like Social Distortion or Johnny Lang or Jackson Brown and do national anthems at baseball games like for the Chicago Cubs and the Diamondbacks during spring training and the Dodgers and people like that. So we try to open up doors for kids as much as we can. If you weren't doing this, what would you be doing? That's a great question. I mean, I've been, really, <laughs> I've been really blessed with a lot of diverse things in my career and I have a lot of interests. I'd probably be, I don't know what I'd be Are doing. Are you a musician? Something with, sport, something with sports um, probably or something in the area of literature. I mean, I like books a lot. So I'd either be, be writing or, you know, be very involved in promoting books and and encouraging more people to read, you know, but something certainly within helping youth, you know, I had a really difficult story on my own side when I grew up mm -hmm. and became pretty successful in the entertainment industry and overcame a lot of very big obstacles in life. Mm -hmm. And that's important to me is to be able to uplift young people and uplift people of all ages, but particularly young people, because my story was so challenging and so difficult and i want to be able to reflect god's love to other people in a lot of ways and be able to encourage people that if i can come out of a dysfunctional challenging situation mm -hmm. and god's grace can help me through that i want to be able to let other people know that there's hope for them as well is there a book inside of you somewhere maybe there's so many people that are way better at that than i <laughs> than i am i just think I've you have so many it. great stories to tell you know, all if the God wants me to do a book, the door will open, but I don't know. I, I thought about it a, a little bit, but there's other things right now I want to do the next five years. Yeah. I just, you know, I think if even Jeff too, having a chance to meet Jeff Moore, the stories you guys must have of just these impactful people that just kind of show up, you know, and you know, uh, it's gotta be just for you personally, just so life-changing, just you personally, you know, what you, what you get from the teen rock center has to just uh, do so much for your mental health, you know, it, it is. And it's also beautiful because we've had a few teen centers call us and we're sort of mentoring and advising one teen center in Colorado. That's bringing in 200 kids a day wow. and one teen center in Michigan that is doing a lot of the same work that we're doing in those two cities. And they're able to come out in person and see, what we're doing, we're able to call them on the phone. And we've had requests from all over the world for people in Sweden and London and Scotland that all over the US that want to do similar teen centers and we're able to give them a lot of advice. But yeah, for our own personal mental health, it's encouraging every single day to see kids come out of adversity from the fact that again, we can acknowledge teens, and we can show them love and kindness. And we're a faith-based organization. We don't hold that back and right. we don't force that in anyone, right. but we want to let them know that God loves us and God loves them. And that we really personally believe that Jesus Christ has changed our life. And we want to be able to offer them that hope and that option. If they choose not to go in that direction, that's, we welcome them at the center all the time, but it's amazing to see life-changing stories when kids say, wow, I want to embrace that idea and come to faith or 
I want to be able to overcome substance abuse. And how do I go about doing that? Well, I'm not a kid, but I'm a kid at heart. And you guys have had a big impact on my life. And um, I've very rarely been felt so welcomed at a place, even the first time that we literally just cold called coming in. I felt so, so welcomed. I told Mike that when we were out there, it's like, man, this, the, these guys really have some culture here. They've really figured it out. I didn't, I didn't feel like in a clinical setting, I didn't feel like I was going to, I don't know. I just, you guys have, like I said, you guys have figured out a culture there that I know from a parent's perspective, having my son Roman there too, I just felt very warm. I can see why kids are drawn to this. And that ultimately goes back to the DNA of Alice and Cheryl. It's they, they were that way. When I met them, we talked for 15 minutes. They didn't have to give me the time of day, Randy. Yeah. They didn't, they literally didn't have to give me the time of day. And I almost had to stop the conversation because I had to get back to my friend. Right. And I felt, I just felt, I don't know that that was such a life changing moment for me that somebody that, you know, important in society. I don't, I hate the word famous. I just don't like that word. Somebody who's such an icon in society could take 15 minutes in a clothing store and talk yeah. to some guy from Iowa, you know, and that, that resonates throughout the, the hallways of the teen center there and, and the staff and everybody has that same persona as Alice and Cheryl, you know, so I congratulate you guys. You've done a great job. Thank you. We love people, you know, whether it's volunteers or teens or our sponsors, you know, we are, we love people. And again, that hopefully is a reflection of us as imperfect people that have been changed by God and been changed by Christ that we want to reflect, you know, that back to others. And we're not perfect. We make mistakes, but we generally love people and we're really open to new ideas. And we love also learning from others and life's about getting wisdom, isn't it? So mm -hmm. we want to learn from people like you as well. You know, it is, that's one of the things I set out on the tour. I got frustrated in the mental health space of everyone kind of being siloed and kind of agenda driven. It's like everyone had their own way to fix these problems. And so I took the mindset with the tour that I, I would go out on an exploration mission, you know, um, where instead of me out there lecturing people, here's the way to fix your life. I was really curious on what other people were doing and what works in Phoenix and works in Richmond, Virginia and Fort Lauderdale, Florida should work in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. That's one right. thing I found out on tour, Randy's, even though the communities were different, there was different, you know, types of, you know, like we did, we did an Indian reservation in New Mexico. We did the Portland refugee center with, with uh, Syrian refugees that came over. Um, Underneath the skin and the color and all that, they, we're all the same. We all have the same hopes. Yes. We have the same fears. We all have the same capacity to love. We all get hurt the same. And that was such a great experience for my boys and I to witness that throughout the summer that I came back a, a changed man. I just literally down to my DNA, I was changed. And now when I see people and I was, someone asked me the other day, what was the biggest thing that the tour did to you, Jeff? And I said, that's a great question. I think now, Randy, when I'm meeting new people or I'm at a place, say an airport or a restaurant, when I look around the room and I see people, I see stories. I see Randy Spencer, a, 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 someone who had a childhood at one point, had parents, you know, had brothers and sisters possibly, had bad things happen in their childhood. And now they've, you know, now I see somebody in a different form, but I've got this ability now to look at people really differently when I meet them. And I look at them more as, what can I learn from this person on their story that can make me a better person? You know? Yeah. Everyone has a story, whether it's the poorest person or the richest CEO, and we're all um, not without adversity, mm -hmm. no matter who we are. And hopefully together we can uplift each other, you know, and, and make a difference in our life. But nobody is without adversity, whether you get sick or you have, a family member die mm -hmm. or you have struggles with, you know, your own family members that are struggling through drugs. And we all need other people to be able to help each other, to be able to get out of those spots. What's next for you guys and how do people reach you? I guess what's the main, if, if someone wants to donate, um, I'm sure I'm going to have people on here that want to help out. Um, like you said, you, you say you're a small nonprofit, but um, you guys are getting bigger. <laughs> um, but people, 
you know, running that facility isn't low cost. I mean, I know you guys probably have a lot of overhead. How do people help out? How do people donate to the rock center there? Uh, what's the easiest way for people to reach you and things like that? Well, we'd love to hear from anyone. They're welcome to call me at 602-522-9200. They can go to our website, alicecoopersolidrock.com. Uh, follow us on Instagram. If you just look up Alice Cooper Solid Rock, uh, you'll find us there. And people can just be involved just either by making a donation or creating awareness. And the most important thing is if they know a teen that lives in Arizona, we would love to you know, meet that team and meet that family. A lot of people have, you know, family and friends that live out here. And if mm -hmm. they're ever in Arizona, they want to come over and see our center and tell them to call us. We'll be happy to give them a tour. We give multiple tours every day from people around the world that come in. Yeah. Well, we're in the stages of planning the living undeterred tour two. We're doing three mini tours. I can't do 95 days <laughs> again. Yeah. That, that was, that was, I bit off a little more I, than I could chew, Randy. But so next summer we're doing three kind of targeted tours and, and we certainly want to come back to the to rock center there and, um, you know, celebrate the opportunity to come back again. Love to have you all, or we'll do something in Mesa. There's a big need everywhere. That would be great. Uh, and then the golf tournament, make sure you get back with me on that. Cause I really do think there's an opportunity for us to come support you guys on that project as well. And, um, thank you. That would be great. That'd be great. Well, listen, man, I really enjoyed this. Um, I know this will post in 2023, but this is being filmed right before the holiday. So I want you to hug the people that you love and uh, be grateful for what you have. And um, uh, I'm really, again, very um, humbled that I had a chance to to not just talk to Alice and, and Cheryl, but to actually participate in, in the, our stop last summer. And it's been an honor to meet you and Jeff and everybody over there at the crew there. And, um, I'm really anticipating our paths crossing again. So have a great holiday. And, um, again, thank you very much for all that you guys do. We can't wait to have you back and thanks for the opportunity to be on here today and allowing us to talk about what we're doing. You bet, man. We'll talk soon.